You're about to listen to a new episode of the Redefining Cybersecurity podcast with Sean Martin. Have you ever thought we're selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Well, perhaps we are. Let's look at how we can organize a successful information security program that integrates business culture with people, process, and technology to drive growth and protect business value. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. At Level Blue, we simplify securing your most valuable business assets by providing broad cybersecurity experience and award-winning services. Level Blue manages the risk. You reap the reward. Learn more at levelblue.com. And here we are. You're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. I am Sean Martin, your host, where if you listen to the show, you know I get to talk to all kinds of cool people about cool topics. And this one is slightly different from the norm of hardcore uh, security operations and building out programs, but still very related. And uh, I'm thrilled it's to have soft. you on. It's more <laughs> it's soft. A soft. It's a softer top. We're not, we're not uh, looking at the, the uh, tech stack necessarily, though we're, I think we will touch on it somehow. But we're looking at the soft skills and uh, how can we architect uh, stuff for success. And I think uh, – Specifically, the book looks at sales, but I think we can learn a lot from it uh, beyond sales as well. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into that and see see if that's true or not. Eugenie, good to see you. Thank you. Always happy to chat with you. And as you mentioned, it's not a hard topic. It's a soft topic today. We're going to talk today about soft skills. <laughs> and it's interesting because you mentioned SOC, you mentioned different technologies. Even if we have a very amazing technology, a very amazing technical idea, if I'm a bright individual that has a lot of ideas, but I don't know how to approach to Sean. I don't know how to sell Sean my idea. <laughs> I'm talking internally, because if you think about this, we're all selling something to each other. Hey, let's right. go for lunch. Hey, let's change this tier one to tier two. Let's change how we have this alert. So we're still selling all the time in a way. So we all, in a way, selling in a different way. And if I don't know how to approach to Sean, if I don't know how to make Sean listen to me, and maybe Sean is very busy and maybe he's multitasking, has several screens, and he's unfocused, and I want to bring him to my attention. But if I created a connection with Sean, if I created a communication with Sean, if Sean liked to talk to me about bikes, about golf, about travel, then it's automatically easier for me to talk to Sean. It's automatically easier for me to convey my ideas. And Sean probably wants to listen to me as well because there is some kind of a connection. There is like a line between us or like a bridge or stairs we can build on top like building blocks. This is the yeah. book is all about. It's how to connect to people. Majority of this relate to sales, but majority <laughs> of this relate to everybody as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you use the, the term stairs and I'm going to use the, the gondola rising, right? <laughs> <laughs> and connection might be biking in cyber. Connection might be skiing in cyber. I'm doing that on purpose, right? Because you, you're bringing people together to have these conversations at yes. the events that you run. And uh, so a shout out to those two things. And hopefully you get uh, in, the, in the summer biking event, hopefully you get some good attendance. And then we get in two um, weeks. Our biking event is I actually, it, it, I wouldn't record in two weeks. Not sure when it's going to be aired, but yes. Right. And then the, uh, then the winter one, on the slopes, which is really cool. So I won't be able to attend the, the summer one, the biking one, which is a bummer because I just got a new bike. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, well, uh, I do I do love to ski, so hopefully I'll get a chance to do the skiing one. But the, the purpose of me bringing the, uh, the, the connection is because ultimately we want to not just do better for ourselves, 
hopefully, um, certainly we want to do better for ourselves, but I think we want the relationship to do better collectively for all parties involved. If we're, if we're looking at an organization for the organization. And if we, I'm assuming if we approach this in a way that that doesn't tap into the soft skills, we leave a lot on the table and, and don't bring all things to bear to get the best results. So let, that's just me guessing where this might go. Let's, let's dig into this. But I, first I wanted to maybe get some thoughts from you on the, the inspiration behind this. I know a number of months back, we, we talked about recording this and you were, mm -hmm. you were still in the process of, of, I don't know if you're still writing or in the, the publishing stage of the book, but um, it was really rooted in, as you mentioned, sales. So cybersecurity organizations and sales teams making the connection to the buyers and driving a successful sale to your point of, of some technology to, to wrap into a program to help a team succeed. Um, what was the inspiration behind that? And how has it, how has it gone? It's actually uh, evolved. The book launching. Yeah. It's evolved because the original idea, there was two ideas that came, maybe even several. One is I saw the ev evolution of the sales engineer. So the first idea was definitely the sales engineering and how engineer change and how the topic became so complex that the salesperson will have a very hard time remember all the nuances of the features. And in the past, I think sales engineers did more like a demo and this was their main job and leave it there. And right now I see they have to be much more involved and doing all this musing and connection with people as well. In the same time, the salespeople now we need to understand more about procurement, much more. In the past, we can just send an email and go do the work or agree when we're gonna sign the PO. Right now, these days are gone, long time ago. You need an NDA, you need an MNDA, you need an MSA. There are so many different acronyms and so many different documents you need to sign to move somewhere that even if everybody liked the solution, you may need to spend another couple of months to actually sign this. So the salespeople became like a procurement gurus. So my initial idea was to talk about how the sales engineer changed and why they can move the sales and help much more with the sales process. In the same time, I saw a very big shift on the connection part because before COVID, we had physical meetings and it's mean we'll physically talk to each other. We'll be in the same room. We're not going to be distracted. We're not going to be on our phones. We're not going to have LinkedIn, Facebook, and other things running in the background on the multiple screens we have. And now you can be on a call. You don't even know if the person listening to you are they actually with you or they just say, yes, yes, nice, nice, and then doing something else. So combining these two together, this was led to me like we need to connect to people. We need to do a better job of connecting and only then when I connected to Sean, then Sean will care about what I'm actually going to say and what's going to happen with about my product. Because if not, Sean may just be in his own way. And on top of this, when I find my editor and started to write, I realize that it's just a kind of tip of the iceberg. We need to build on top of this. So I teach you, and again, don't forget, this book is not about how to close deals. It's not about core selling. It's about connecting to people. And there is many other books that will teach you how to sell and your CRO and your sales manager and your CEO will teach you how to sell. Yeah. But we do have amazingly smart individuals that have ideas, but they cannot convey them in a very good way. So one example, I may jump on a call and they're gonna be amazingly bright CTO or sales engineer. And he will start to explain to me, um, so we designed this uh, car, mm, and it was brilliant because uh, I did this in the army and mm, no, you know, like we put AI, like, what are you talking about? Like, I know there is a smart idea, but I lost you. So if you think about this, the traditional soft skills are empathy, active listening, emotional intelligence, maybe understanding the, the part, but it's not there. It's not just, sorry, it's not just this. Is if I'm talking to you, and I cannot control my voice. I don't have a good way to do it. 
then it's also a problem because now I don't want to listen to you or I lose focus, I lose attention. And we have such a small kind of delta of your attention span when you're actually going to listen to me. So what if you record yourself as a human being applicable to anyone? Maybe you present internally to your manager. Maybe you present to your team. Maybe you do whatever it is. How many of us record ourselves, listen to ourselves, and start understanding, oh, how my voice sound? Am I too low? Am I too loud? Am I too fast? Do, which filler words I'm using? Don't get me wrong. I had a lot of filler words, and I still have some. I use so, I use awesome, that I still couldn't re remove from myself. But using the technology analogy, I have like a watchdog in my head that watch how I speak and remind me, slow down. You don't need to rush anywhere. You don't have to have a filler word. You can just pause between the words. You can just pause between the sentences. But let's build on top of it. Do you know how to ask questions? Do you want to know if you ask close question or an open question, when do you use which? I was just joking on, on LinkedIn, like literally before we started this conversation. Then when I announce I'm working for a new company, I am an author of my book, I had five people reach to me to ask if I need a pen test, a stock analysis, or mobile development. <laughs> like, seriously? Like, you cannot do a basic <laughs> research to understand what just happened? So this is annoying for customers to understand they're not doing this. But back to customers, part of the book is the human communication. If I'm a salesperson and I am talking to you and I'm describing to you the process of how this gonna, engagement is going to go, then this is what the customer needs to ask as well. I have a different presentation that actually helping customers to deal better with these vendors. And like, hey, what is the process? How long the legal will take? Or even the customers may tell the vendor how they want this information. And this was the other part that also was a big motivation for the book. We jump on these calls and the vendors start let me show you my presentation. Oh, let me show let you my Let me demo. tell you about your problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How often the sales teams, sales engineer, salesperson, <coughs> sorry about that, ask the customer, hey, Mr. Customer, I know you probably know how you like to convey the information. Do you want me to do a demo? Do you want me to talk about my solution? Do you want me to present to you? Do you want to talk about architecture? We don't see this very often. So. If you're the customer and you're listening to this right now, this is for you. When the vendor jump on a call, you have all the rights to tell them, hello, Mr. Vendor, I'm very interested in what you guys can do. I am an audio person or I'm a video person or I am depend on your learning style and we all have different styles. I want you to start there or maybe start with a few slides and then that do the demo or talk me about the design. So you have all the power to do this. Like for example, what I do when a vendor present to me, I always ask, is it okay if I interrupt you in the middle? Now I'm not rude and the vendor say, yes, of course. Or when I'm presenting, I always say, guys, by the way, I know the material. So I don't need to tell you everything I know. If I'm not relevant or you want me to ask you a question, stop me anytime. This way I'm giving people this option, okay, can do that. In my mind, it is all soft skills. And you mentioned about the connection part, because again, I'm jumping from place to place, but it's all in the book. If you remember Dale Carnegie, how to connect to people, how to find friends and influence people, some of the inspiration came from there as well. How do we connect to people? I can jump with you on a call and I can see you something behind you and we can talk about that. Or I may do a research and see that you in bikes or in, in, in skis, like, oh, by the way, I like skiing. What are you thinking about skiing? Again, we have to manage this not to be creepy. I'm like, oh, Sean, how are you doing? I know you went to Tahoe last year. How was this ride? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so let, let me ask you this, because I've had experiences uh, where I was working at a vendor um, and I was doing marketing and was involved with sales enablement, but had a very clear line draw for me that I was not in sales. And 
was specifically told you you are not to engage with a client outside of sales doing that and sales wow. can choose to bring you in and it was very shocking to me because um, obviously my goal was to bring in a client and and solve their problem and make a sale for the company um, but I, I bring that up because I, I just think either as direct as that lines are drawn or sometimes just cultures draw certain lines and say this is your lane Play in your lane. Don't jump into mine so you don't mess my thing up. Or I'm the sales person. I own this relationship. I don't want – there might be some some ego there and some fear that the, the deal might get screwed up, <laughs> right? So the, there are these lines, right, either purposely and directly drawn or just culturally loosely drawn that yeah. even, even if you have the skills – which we're going to get into in a minute, but if, even if you have them, sometimes you may not have the opportunity to use them. I don't know if you've ever uncovered that. But. So I work for a company called Her Joy Group, not called Sideris, for a very long time. And for a very, very long time, we had no, n no titles at all, you know, because basically everybody was a sales in the company. And if you think about that, we have this idea of elevator pitch. So if you're going with somebody in the elevator, and they ask, hey, Sean, what do you do for a living? You're like, oh, I am a marketing person in this company. So you're selling. Like, if you don't know, if you're not selling, what else are you doing? You're telling about the company. If you're doing a good pitch, then yes. Now, we have different levels of selling. We could say, okay, Sean made the initial connection, and then somebody, Julia, John, whatever it is on the other side, like your idea. Like, by the way, I'm going to understand where you live, where your geographical area, and I'm going to find the person in charge on your account, on in charge on your field, or whatever vertical it is. So my personal view, everybody in sales all the time for each company, every company, because if I see a Facebook employee and he doesn't know what's Facebook, what they do, then it's like, why you work there? You don't need to know every nuance of the company, but at least understand what is the main vector of the company is quite fundamental for me. And we should teach everyone to express their, their ideas and how is it done correctly. So this is, again, this is my, my view on the part. It doesn't mean I'm correct. It's just I have my own opinions. So t talk to me about, so clearly, well, maybe not clearly. People, I think <laughs> we're learning some things here now. But so initially written for sales, I think your your statement just now basically says everybody's selling <laughs> right, at some level. Um, so I think everybody can find value in, in the things that you're writing in the book from, from a, yes. really from a so there's, perspective, yeah. right? There are specific yeah. chapters going to be more oriented for people that selling, you know, how to ask questions. I just say, you know, it's a filler word. Bad, bad beginning. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff that are oriented for the sales team. So it's a technical person or not a technical person or for marketing as well. How to research, how to ask questions that we apply to everyone. There's a chapter about POC. There's some history about sales. There's a chapter about teams and how teams of sales and sales engineering work together. But there's also chapters that are applicable to everyone and they're the building blocks like the voice. But there is also a chapter about fear. What if I'm afraid to go to present to a board? What I'm afraid to do this call? What is the big is too big? The deal is too big, and I need to prepare myself, or I need to have a presentation. There is a chapter about how to set up your video because we're now doing Zooms, Teams, Googles. So I have four screens. I use a teleprompter. I have a high-end web camera. I have a microphone here. I have two lights here. There's many different things that's happening that took me a while to understand. What if I have a standing desk? Can I use a standing desk? So this is all like thin bits and building blocks that are creating the better portfolio yourself, like a tuning of a personality, the same as if you take a car and we tune different things, you cannot work by themselves. And if you stay in the idea of the car, this is a chapter that came later on in the book that was not originally there, but about how we present. So it's basically about burnout. 
if I do 8, 10, 12, 16 calls a day, I may be going to be overwhelmed. So what if the call number 6 or 7 didn't go as expected? How do I do call number 8? How do I actually stabilize myself? Do I need to think about what? So there is these chapters that are applicable to everyone because we all do them. Even if you're doing an internal job as an engineer, a marketing on a HR person, and you're constantly on a calls, can you make it better? I'm a big believer of a video call. And um, I don't think anybody can convince me otherwise because five years ago, there was no other way. You went for a physical meeting and I saw you. It didn't come in a box. So don't tell me I don't do video calls because this is how most meeting was. We went present into the room and we spoke to each other. And if you don't want to make your hair or have a baseball hat because you forgot to do a shower, then it's a different problem. Because many people say, oh, I don't want a video call. It's like, why? I have a massive background. Why? Now, having said this, you may be working out of a hotel. You may be working out of the small apartment. Maybe you have kids. I can understand in general why maybe you cannot do this. But if you're not, then I think it's your responsibility as a professional person to be on video and to sound nice as well. To spend some time on the microphone because I was had this conversation with a friend. He's like, no, no, I don't need the microphone. Why would I spend 100 bucks? I was like, wait a second. If you're going to go to a customer, would you buy a shoes? Would you buy a suit? You're like, oh, yeah, of course. So why would you not spend money on the microphone or on the webcam? And it's applicable to anyone. No, if you don't use a good camera, then the people are not going to look, you're not going to look worth other people. Maybe you cannot control the white balance of your camera and you're working with a different environment that people are going to look green or bluish or yellowish. It's all perception. It's all how people take you right now. Yeah. As you were describing, would you buy shoes or a jacket or something? I was just thinking, would you walk to a walk to a meeting and end up there all sweaty, <laughs> or would you take a cab, right? You probably you probably try to do the cab. You know, sometimes <laughs> there is like I, it was funny enough. We were me and my friend was driving to present, and we were both presenting in the same conference, and we realized that driving will be slower than walking because of downtown Toronto. He, he So he was presenting first. He ended up running there. Eventually, I came first and I presented just to make sure he's okay because he was also acting like that. So we were laughing about uh, this exact same problem. Yeah. So it did, it's a, what I'm taking from this is presenting yourself in the best possible way and not not accidentally arriving there, but having some thought and and practice and even listening and watching yourself to know how you at least are presenting. And then hopefully as, as you said, if you can if you can share your material, quote unquote material, your presentation, whatever, with a manager or a peer, you might get some feedback as well for how you're being received. Um so how how do you feel how do you find that people will use the book? Is it a read it from start to finish? Would they, would they be able to find the chapters that are most relevant to them? How, how would, I how think would you recommend? depending on the person, they can, they can of course look and choose the chapters they want. I think it's a good idea to start from, from beginning and maybe skip some chapters. But what we also included in the end is something I call SSDP. It's, um, in the beginning it was called a cheat sheet. So basically, it's a plan for 30, 60, 90, 120 days on how okay. to improve your soft skills. And this is going to be available on the website as well. So I have a website. And so on the SSDB website, it stands for soft, soft skills. skills development plan. You know, it's there right you. here. So it's Perfect. a 30, 60, 90, 120 days, how to improve your soft skills and how to also reflect on your soft skills as well. So find a peer, find somebody that's going to judge you, not judge you, help you, mentor you, and what you can do, how you can, what kind of training you can do to improve your soft skills, how you work on active listening, how to you kind of broaden your horizon to understand how to connect better to people, what to talk about them. I also tell people, don't fake stuff. Like one of the examples in the, in the book is I'm never going to have a guitar behind me because I don't play guitar, because it's called a reverse hook. 
He's like, oh, again, you have a guitar. What do you play? I was like, oh, I don't play anything, but I saw you play guitar, so I put a guitar there. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, we're not, we're not doing that. But you may see other sports, again, have a huge green screen behind me sometimes. And you're like, oh, my God, what is up with the green screen? It's like, oh, I have a podcast in media, so I can open up and talk about it. So there's different, different ways to connect. It could be find the hooks. It could be reverse hooks. It could do some, some research. It could be completely calm, cold talking, and just see what you find and connect with them. But this is where broaden our horizon helps to us. And one thing people ask me, how do you actually practice soft skills? And you practice soft skills not at work. You practice them outside of your work with the people you don't know. So you're trying to connect to people when you in the lineup, when you're buying groceries. This is one of the things I'm doing all the time. I'm trying to have the person behind the counter to smile when we're doing the cashier. So if I can make the cashier smile, ding, check, I did my goodwill for today. And I guess what? I practice and it makes them a bit more happy. So it's a win-win situation. If I didn't make them smile, okay, that it didn't work for me, but at least I can find the line. Talk about the weather, the lighting, the whatever yeah. is happening. So talk to me as we start to wrap here. Is what you just said, you you made an attempt and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Is there is there a way to measure? Is there a mean time to uh, soft skills? <laughs> so first of all, we need to understand that we're taking our, ourselves out of the comfort zone. So it means that we're doing something we're not used to do in, in some cases. Because if we continue doing what we're doing right now, it means we're not learning anything. So one, don't try to do it all the time. Try to check and see what's working and what is the reaction you're getting because you're not going to have 100% and it's totally fine. I like the idea of 80-20 rules. You're doing 80% 80, 80 of the time what you know and the 20% you're doing something else and you're trying to experiment with stuff. So the measurement here is you find a new way to connect to people and you practice this like 10 times, for example. And you see how many times it worked. If it worked two or three times and it's something clicked and you can continue doing this and refine the technique. So this is, I guess, the measurement. And I think the best way to understand is does people want to talk to you again? No. So let's say I've been in your podcast already twice or three times. I think I made something great because you do want to invite me back. So here you go. Here's your measurement. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Eugenie, it's a, it's always a pleasure chatting with you and, uh, I will, I'll miss you in Vegas and I'll miss you at the, at the bike, uh, summit, <laughs> both the conference and the, and the top when you, when you get to the top, but hopefully I'll get to see you soon. And, and congratulations on the book. Thank it you. is architecting success, the art of soft skills and technical sales connect the cell more, uh, just released a couple weeks back. Now I'm going to link to this on Amazon for the U S and uh, Canada. I think I have both those links and I encourage everybody to be purposeful in this. I think to your point at the very beginning, we're all selling something either ourselves or on behalf of the company. And the better prepared we are, the more deliberate we are, the more precise we are with how we connect with others. Hopefully we'll do a better job at selling whatever it is we're, we're slinging. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to us. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Enjoy. Yeah, Vegas. You're amazing. Thank you. And uh, everybody listening and watching, please do grab a copy of the book. And uh, please do also stay tuned to more Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. Subscribe and share with your friends and enemies. And we'll uh, see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. At Level Blue, we simplify securing your most valuable business assets by providing broad cybersecurity experience and award-winning services. Level Blue manages the risk. You reap the reward. Learn more at levelblue.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast with Sean Martin. Please take a moment to rate the show and leave a comment. And remember to share the Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Come back for more conversations and follow Sean Martin as he continues his journey towards redefining cybersecurity.